Welcome back to SuperCloud 3, where we explore the security challenges faced by developers, CISOs, SecOps pros, and specifically related to building a common cloud experience across all estates. And we're also digging into the impact of AI and addressing these issues. With me now is Manoj Nair, the Chief Product Officer at Sneak. Manoj, good to see you again, back in theCUBE. Hey Dave, it's always a pleasure to be here. All right, let's get into it. And, and when you think about how cloud has impacted security, it's like the cloud has become this first line of defense, if you will, and that's great because you got, you know, probably better security than you maybe had on-prem, at least for most customers. But you also now have multiple shared responsibility models. You got different experiences across cloud. So the CISO and the SecOps teams are asking developers to build security into code and design in security from the start. So how do you see these fundamental trends shaping and impacting customers today? Um, Dave, you said it, you know, it's both a opportunity and a risk, right? Uh, when you think about cloud, um, cloud is code, essentially. It's uh, APIs and you use infrastructure as code and the whole thing is built as, with software. So it's not your typical infrastructure. So that's part of the opportunity that if you really think about an application, it's no longer just what you package and, you know, you toss it over a wall. You can make that whole con continuum something that a developer can automate and make it part of their, you know, how the work that they do. So this whole shift to DevOps, you know, we're, we're kind of we're pretty much, you know, way into it, but DevSecOps and putting security right in the middle and security all the way from, you know, the concept of creating the thing to the deployment and the continuous um, security of that. And that's the shift that we believe is still happening, a lot of uh, folks are trying to get a good handle on that. Uh, and that's, you know, part of, uh, you know, how, how a company like us was created to enable that developer security, right? The developer allowed, but security trusted. So you got to make it easy. Um, devs have a lot to do. And part of the goal here to make that vision a reality is how do you make it easy and make it a culture change? Really focusing on automation and fixing as you go rather than the traditional finding after the fact, which, you know, I feel I spent a lot of time in the security industry and still a lot of security is really about auditing and finding after the fact. Here's an opportunity to just do it right and do it continuously and, uh, and make sure it's, uh, but but that that's really the shift that uh, we think uh, we're right in the middle of. Well, thank you for that. Now, so given the increase complexity, which cloud, well, in many cases it simplifies things, but also, sometimes has the reverse effect. So you got these cloud environments and you got all these different services that are offered by different cloud providers. How does Sneak specifically adapt its tools to cater to this sort of heterogeneous environment? In other words, how does your technology align with the super cloud concept? And does it help to simplify the security management for devs across multiple clouds specifically? Uh, it's a great question, Dave. You know, if if you treat each cloud, you know, separately after the fact, you know, post deployment uh, is one of the words we use, uh, then it has to end up becoming bespoke, and you can try and abstract it as much as you can, but the, the, you're you're trying to secure the configuration of, uh, you know, all the controls in the cloud, plus your application in each of those clouds. Now one of the things that you get an advantage by starting earlier in the software development life cycle is to try and make that security built, built in part happen sooner and sooner. So you think about most code today, uh, 70 to 90% of code based on different uh, research that we've seen is open source code. So we start, you know, look at that and say, can I secure the choices being made by the developer and then can I continuously make sure that that open source code choices that are being made, and it's a very deep dependency problem because it's not just the open source you're using, it's what are the other open source developers that you're using use and then so on and so forth. Uh, but that's completely you know, independent of cloud. Then you look at your own first party code and that's you know, uh, a big part of, again, look, get the fundamentals right and do it as you're building that code, educate developers about security and help fix those issues before they even show up. And then you think about the container packaging of that. Like, can, that can be a lot of 
code, you know, even with cloud native services, there are different kinds of container infrastructure, but still packaging, it's, you know, almost a standard there. What are the different layers of that container packages and images and, you know, the best practices that enterprises have now started building there. And then finally, infrastructure as code is what's used for deploying. And there's a way to check whether you're using something like uh, Terraform that is platform independent or you're using platform dependent uh, you know, versions of infrastructure as code, there's ways to check config and policy there. And then finally, you know, we think of you know, cloud configuration that you know, all of this is pre-deployment. And so all this can be done pre-deploy. And so your post-deploy verification becomes a verification step rather than you're finding those issues post-deploy, right? So 90-10 versus 10-90. And that's that shift that you can do. And by doing that right, you're also giving flexibility on which cloud deployment, like you don't have to redo your security entirely. You can you know, do 10% different, but you don't have to rethink of the entire security posture depending on which cloud you are. So it's interesting what you described because on the one hand, so you, you talked earlier about cloud as code. So that simplifies things, but then you talked about all this complexity um, on the back end. So cloud is code, but now, now code is now, now natural language. And when you think about security breaches, they oftentimes occur to vulner, due to vulnerabilities and things like open source libraries. And you got these libraries growing exponentially. So are you, and or how are you using AI to keep pace? I.e. what approaches might you be using to ensure things like continuous monitoring or rapid response so that you, you're not sort of doing it after the fact as you, you just described. Yeah. What's the role of AI? Well, there, there's two uh, very key parts here. One is uh, security of AI, and then the other is using AI to help make some of these things easier. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll break down the first part and then we can take the second part separately, right? So when, when you know, the opportunity with uh, AI and especially generative AI is, you know, it's kind of created this moment where, and I'll just focus on the dev part, you know, we all know and we love using, uh, you know, various uh, generative AI tools for the kids' birthday party poems and other things. But when it comes to code, you need to train it with specific context. And what is being done for most of the AI generated, you know, code generative AI tools is they use open source. Now, part of what we know is, you know, I talked about open source uh, issues. Um, well, there's a lot of, uh, you know, security problems with open source code. That's one of the first things, that's where a company like Sneak actually started as securing open source code. So we understand that inherently, uh, but not all the models when they train it, think about it that way. Then there's the human context re required. Every day there's a new zero day and our security researchers keep finding, you know, tens to hundreds of it. And how does that, you know, if you have a model that's pre-trained, it needs to catch up with that evolving landscape. And what we're seeing is that something that is essentially, you know, uh, making, a, you know, an inference of what code should look like based on pre-training on potentially insecure code doesn't necessarily generate secure code at the end. Um, you know, I've got customers who tell me, look, uh, you know, uh, the code generative uh, solutions are improving productivity 40, 45%. But what if it, it's creating, uh, you know, security vulnerabilities at a 50 to 70%, right? Like now all you're doing is creating these issues faster. And fundamentally what we're seeing that's doing is it's making, um, you know, uh, CISOs and security teams really conscious about the fact that they cannot do this post facto part that you talked about. You have to make that, you know, whether shift left is a buzzword or not, you got to like really shift that early detection. You almost need to make sure that you're embedding technologies that catch these issues right where the code is being created, not after the fact. Uh, so that's one of the big trends we're seeing is AI generated code, great for productivity, uh, there was a Stanford research and a few other research, NYU, that shows that AI-generated code ends up producing more insecure code. Partly it's because of the technology reason I talked about, but partly it's because of the psychological reason where a machine generates something. And you know, depending on how senior the developer is, you may or may not actually check what is generated. You don't even feel the ownership of what is generated. And so these are the 
challenges that the security teams that I'm talking to and CISOs and really large companies, that's what they're dealing with today. All right, so then, th th thank you. And now let's deal with the second part of yeah. the, the, the other side of the coin. And so as we go from multi-cloud being, hey, my product runs in, in a you know, cloud A and cloud B and cloud C, and it's all kind of a different experience. As we move towards super cloud, I, I, I'll ask the question this way. You think about your product, it's becoming an integral part of a lot of companies' DevOps workflows. So I'd love to hear your insights about how customer needs and concerns are changing in light of that broader shift from you know, multi-cloud to what we're calling super cloud. What are some of those obstacles that customers face with managing security? And to your point, using AI to make things easier, how does that fit? Yeah, um, you know, one of the big obstacles uh, with, with that shift is just uh, standardization of some of these uh, tools. You know, we talked about the complexity, Dave, you talked about cloud was supposed to make it, you know, a little easier, it's code, but yet you have all these parts. And uh, traditional app security really grew up in a age of compliance and audits. And so you just use whatever tool that you use for a certain part of your code stack and it didn't matter. Um, and now it matters because velocity is important. Dev productivity is important. So you cannot treat these different aspects, all of what I described, whether it's open source, first party code, containers, infrastructures code, that whole could AI, that, um, that they're you know, not having holistic platforms as a challenge. And that's one of the things that you know, uh, a Dell per security solution is actually uh, like us is trying to solve is have a, you know, a seamless, continuous approach. Uh, the other part is a culture change. Now, I talked about this culture to DevSecOps and that really is an ownership and it's not going to happen if the developers are given more and more to do. You got to make sure it is intelligence and it's, uh, you know, it's something that is a, you know, partly educating, partly making it intelligent. And this is really the opportunity we see with AI is you know there's not one part you know it's very loaded there's ai there's machine learning llms and all that but what we are doing instead of having a generic ai solution that can you know generate your drama script and can generate your code uh, and can secure it we're saying we do one thing and one thing only right so it's like a full self-driving car analogy i'll use the car needs ai that understands rules and you know uh, ml that learns from sensory changes in the world on how to react when things change. You combine all of that, focus on one thing that's securing code, doesn't matter how it was generated, human or AI, and now you're able to do this enhancement of you know, productivity. It's going to happen. Anything that creates productivity enhancements gets adopted by devs. And that opportunity is where we see a big push now uh, and that actually makes that shift left vision of security a reality. Uh, and, and that's you know, a great opportunity now to simplify some of the siloed complexity that was introduced with you know, solutions from the past. And, and you're doing that across cloud in, in a way that sort of hides that complexity. And I, I like what you're saying about the focus, but then it leads me to another question. I think about like storage vendors trying to build a common storage layer across clouds or what VMware is trying to do with cross cloud. You got Red Hat with, with OpenShift trying to create sort of a similar, you know, consistent experience. Snowflake doing it in, in data, Databricks doing it in data, you guys doing it for, for dev. So you've got these, which is the right thing, focused specialists knocking down different parts of their value chain. How do you see that coming together? It can, <laughs> does it even add more complexity or does that simplify things in your view? I think uh, you know it's a really matter of um, you know context is king in in some ways. And uh, as a product management leader, I think of product managers. What do they give developers? They give them context so then they can build a better solution than rather than telling them what to build. What we are giving them is security context right where they are to make better choices. And it's you know that offers abstraction too as a side effect, right? Unless you brought it up, I wouldn't have thought it necessarily in those terms, Dave. But the abstraction comes from the fact that this is context. For us, a cloud deployment is context. And what we have done with cloud, a lot of CSPM, CNAP vendors focus on finding these issues and trying to figure out attack paths. 
we actually bring that cloud deployed context all the way in the hands of the AppSec teams and the developers. So they know that this line of change here, based on their actual cloud deployment model, whichever cloud it is, this particular change is going to impact your cloud deployment in, in X, Y, Z ways. We're bringing that pre into the loop. And that is another way of you know, abstracting and reducing the complexity and enabling uh, you know, some of these choices. You might, you know, we use multiple clouds. Uh, we do it because we like the capability of those different clouds. We don't want every developer in our teams to actually figure out all the details. So platform teams uh, get created that abstract it. And a lot of the technologies you mentioned, you know, we're a customer and partner of Snowflake. We use it in our platform. Not every developer of ours needs to be an expert in that thing. It's available as a service. And that's where we're really seeing security really is also getting built in into that platform stack. And then everyone consumes that stack. And so that's the way to actually handle this from becoming layers of complexity. You're giving this as building blocks to the devs who in the end are creating all this innovation and they just have a simplified set of building blocks and the building blocks themselves are abstracting the complexity away from the uh, dev teams. So I'm probably going to keep you a little longer than I initially thought um, because this is such an interesting conversation. And I wonder, Alex, if you could go back to a, a one shot of Manoj because over his shoulder it says, make every developer part of your security team. And the reason why I think this is so interesting is because the, the CISO and the SecOps teams are asking a lot of the devs and the devs, they're not security experts. Right? So this is where you guys come in. So, so you're helping to simplify that, but I want to ask a sort of a zoom out and ask you a big picture question that we're asking everybody. Ultimately in your view, will, will AI be more beneficial to attackers or defenders and why do you think that? Well, it's uh, from the time I've been in security, you know, uh, you know, Dave, we've talked about, I've been part of nation state attacks when I was back at RSA leading the response. It's always a cat and mouse game. I think done right. Uh, AI, you know, uh, you know, just being careful about how you adopt it. And this is where education is key. And this is something we're trying to educate teams that might not be thinking about it. They're looking at the sizzle aspect of, oh, wow, I can generate code you know, using a chat interface or an API or some tool that has built it into their thing and not thinking through all the aspects and there are security aspects, there's quality aspects, there's privacy and data governance and IP aspects. Now, if you can really think about this as, you know, I'm going to make the devs more productive. And a lot of, you know, if you look at some of the attack patterns from the last year, it's so easy to get into an organization with supply chain attacks but that same you know, focus by empowering the devs with you know, responsible use of AI technologies and really marrying it with responsible use of AI security technologies makes it much more easier for you to build in security into the stack rather than just bolting it on after the fact. And you know, so my belief, you know, I'm optimistic um, and uh, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of education and tooling and culture change, all of it coming together. But the potential here is that you make a generational leap in our ability to actually tackle some of these issues that just don't seem to go away. Okay, last question. So you're the, the chief product officer at Sneak. You, so you have a unique vantage point on the intersection of security and developer trends. So thinking about the context of, of this AI super cloud era, what emerging security challenges do you anticipate that developers are going to face in the next, say, midterm, three to five years? I guess that's mid to long term in these days. And how are you planning to evolve your product portfolio to meet these, these threats? No, I think, I think the here and now uh, challenge we talked about, uh, but that'll probably continue for the midterm. And that is, Organizations are going to want, and it doesn't matter what your compliance posture is, what your governance posture is, you are going to want to uh, adopt this technology because it fosters faster innovation. And that's everything we've seen, cloud, all the technologies we talked about in the past. All, if you are actually improving innovation, you're probably going to get adopted. And so that's kind of the here and now problem. And, and where we are with that is, you know, we introduced things like, uh, Deep code AI is our AI engine. It does one thing and one thing well. It understands code 
and it uses layers of AI, hybrid AI, we call it symbolic uh, machine learning and LLM to find issues real time and fix issues as you're writing code. And that writing can be done by a different AI that is a code generative AI. So that's something that a lot of uh, our customers look at it as a reason to accelerate shift left, get this technology right in the IDE where the developers are writing code or using generative AI solutions and marry sneak code, you know, and deep code AI fix uh, as the fix feature right in there. But, and that's the start. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, we started seeing things uh, where uh, the open source ML engines uh, can get attacked and that can be a new compromise vector. Uh, prompt engineering is great, but you know, you're able to you know, uh, use that and uh, you're able to use that as an attack vector too uh, and, and really training the safety of AI in that context. Uh, what data is getting used by the developer? And so as we go from just generating code and innovation faster, a lot of people are gonna to wanna to use AI. Well, how do you responsibly use data in the context of AI? And you know, finally, the security of those solutions itself. And there's a lot of you know, noise, rumor, reality, innuendo that, hey, maybe some of these models are poison. Well, we know that theoretically it is possible and anything that's theoretically possible is going to get exploited. And so how do you secure the actual engines itself that devs might be using? So we see all of these as, as uh, areas of uh, focus. Um, and then the cloud capabilities keep exploding. And so you want to leverage the native goodness of every cloud while not making it a burden. And so enabling that evolution to more of a platform teams is another part of it that, that we see our, uh, us empowering uh, really security being built into the platform. Uh, and uh, that, you know, th that's a trajectory that all these trends are offering. Yeah, well, the whole industry is really focusing on these mega trends, uh, Manoj, and you're right at the heart of it with your, your product knowledge and your deep expertise. You've always been a great contributor to theCUBE, so thanks for coming back on. Thank, thank you, Dave, number 13. Number there, lucky 13. All right, keep it right there for more content from SuperCloud 3 live and on demand from theCUBE's Palo Alto studios, and of course, on theCUBE.net.